Okay, so in the last lecture, we derived our equation for the Duhamel integral. And we, you know, we arrived at an equation, it looked fairly complicated, and it wasn't immediately obvious what you do with it, well, you know, how do you actually solve it. So that's what we're going to start picking apart in this particular lecture. So we, we, we kind of said that the whole analysis process starts off somewhere up here where we have some force that we want to apply to a single degree of freedom system, right? Well, we kind of know now at this point that we can take that force and we can plug it into the equation that we derived in the last lecture to do Hamel integral equation. And now we're at this point here where we have to actually solve that equation. We have to perform the integration. Now, we can perform that integration one of two ways, as I've said a couple of times now, either analytically or numerically, right? So the, the analytical solution is what we're going to work on in this particular lecture. And what that really means is applying the rules of integration. Those rules of integration we all learned at some point in the past that approach is going to give you if you can if you can get all the way to the end if you can get that over the line that's going to give you an exact solution and that's great okay an exact solution sounds nice um but it's going to be depending on how complicated the forcing that is being applied or the force that's being applied to your structure is depending on how complex that is it might be quite an ordeal to get your way down through an, analy an analytical integration down to an exact solution. So the other approach that we could take is the numerical solution. So we need to perform, we would perform the integration numerically. And what that actually means is, that actually means just using the trapezoidal rule or Simpson's rule, you know, there's, what is there, there's the rectangular summation rule, there's Simpson's rule, trapezoidal rule. I tend to favor the trapezoidal rule. It's fairly simple and straightforward to use. So this is just using the trapezoidal trapezoidal rule uh, to perform, I'll just say use trapezoidal rule, to perform the numerical integration. Now, what are the what are the what are the downsides? The downside, technically, this is only an approximation, right? You're gonna get an approximate solution. So like any numerical technique, it's going to be approximate and its accuracy is going to depend on a number of different things. Now, the, the upside to this is it's extremely versatile, right? It's extremely versatile. I'll also go out on a limb and I'll say it's an awful lot simpler than the analytical route. You know, in, in practical scenarios, you're almost certainly going to end up performing a numerical solution rather than an analytical solution. Okay, so having said all of that, let's just, because we're trying to give a sort of a full rounded picture here of the Duhamel integral approach, let's just demonstrate this um, this analytical approach for a simple forcing function. So, and, and it's, gonna keep, it's gonna be very simple, right? So we're gonna consider the analytical solution for what's called a ramp load a load that increases from a value of zero up to some maximum value linearly right over a certain period of time so if i set up a, a little a little visual of that so we'll say here if the the y axis is going to be load magnitude the x axis is going to be time we'll say that the ramp load that we're considering the response of their system to is going to be something like this so it goes, starts at zero, increases linearly up to a maximum value. That maximum value is going to be P0, and it takes T1 seconds to get there, right? So the name we would give to this thing is a ramp load. So I want to apply this loading to my single degree of freedom system and determine the, uh, the response of the system. Now, we can capture that loading in a very simple uh, expression. So it's going to be P0 T over t1 right so the 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 magnitude of the load is given by is given by this equation here now that's a simple expression right so that's our first clue that we might be able to try an analytical solution for this and of course we can work out an analytical solution for this right so the next step is to take that loading function and plug it straight into our duhamel integral so the response of our single degree of freedom system is given by the following all right, and so there we have it. There's our, our, we previously that was f of tau, and we've literally just plugged in and replaced our, our loading function uh, in for f of tau here, right? So this is now the integration that we have to do. Now, you look at that integration and, you know, you might look at that integration and it might fill you with terror, but we can simplify things a little bit here. We're only going to simulate the response of our system for the duration of load application, right? So in a sense, we're not really going to be simulating the free vibration response of our system 
after the load is applied, right? And so what that really means is there's got the damping in the system is going to have a negligible impact on the response of the system. So this is my sort of sort of justification for saying let's simplify this a little bit and let's let the damping equal to zero. Okay, you don't have to, you know, you can solve this thing with damping in it, but we're going to solve it and we're going to solve a simpler version of it and we're going to make it simpler by assuming the damping ratio is zero, no damping in the system. And that's justifiable because we're only simulating the driven response, right? The forced response rather than any, any sort of free vibration response that would follow after the force has been removed. So I'll say we only want the system response during load application. And so we'll say damping has a negligible impact. And I'm going to simplify my life by basically saying xi is equal to zero. Okay, so that, that expression up there simplifies down to the following d tau. Okay, so now this is the integral that we're going to solve because we chickened out and didn't want to solve this one up here. So basically I've got to integrate. I've got to perform this integration and I'm going to chicken out even more Right? And I'm not going to actually apply the rules to solve this integration. I don't kind of believe in doing any work, any extra work that you don't have to do. So I am going to jump over to a Jupyter Notebook and I'm going to let SymPy, Python and the SymPy library within Python do the hard work for me. Right, So I'm going to say solve this, solve this, dot, 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 using SymPy. So unless the objective is to demonstrate your knowledge of integration. That's not our objective here. Um, let's just use a tool. Let's just use pick a tool out of the toolbox and use a tool to solve this thing. So we'll jump over to a notebook and we'll pick up the story over there. Okay, so here we are over in our Jupyter Notebook. So presumably you're either familiar with the use of Jupyter Notebooks or you've watched the videos that I, or the one video that I directed you towards in the previous lecture where I sort of walk you through setting up a Jupyter Notebook. So I won't spend too much time here, you know, on the ins and outs of what are Jupyter Notebooks and how do they work? Other than to say that I'm importing at the top here some sort of fairly standard imports that I'm going to end up importing into every notebook that we write inside of uh, inside of this project. So the first one here, I'll just very briefly go through them. You probably are familiar with them already. So I'm importing math here. That just allows me to perform mathematical operations, gives me some math functionality when I'm working in Python. Um, I'm going to bring in NumPy. NumPy is a library that makes it really easy for me to work with with arrays or sequences of numbers. And if you've come from a MATLAB environment or you're used to working in MATLAB, well then NumPy will make your workflow in Python very similar to MATLAB. And then the last one here is matplotlib. This is, uh, matplotlib is a, a data visualization library um, within uh, within the Python ecosystem. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna use it for, for plotting. So these are the, the sort of three probably most common uh, libraries that I end up importing into all of my projects. So so we'll execute that cell. Then the next thing we have here is a markdown cell. That's just a bit of text, just to make things a little bit more presentable, a little bit of a heading. And now we're into actually coding. Right, so we need to perform an analytical integration here. And we're gonna use SymPy, another, another Python library to perform that integration for us. So in order to use SymPy, the first thing we have to do is import it. So I'll just import, uh, let me see, SymPy, uh, not from, but SymPy as, SYM. Okay, so this just basically gives us a whole heap of additional functionality. Now, the first thing I'm going to do after importing is say, uh, let me see, init init printing. So I'm calling the init printing method from SymPy. That just means I can, every time I print an equation, it's going to print out in a nice readable format rather than all on a single line. To work with uh, symbolic math, using SymPy, we're going, to, we're going to use symbols, right? Now, typically when I say m is equal to something, I'm defining a variable, right? I'm saying m is equal to usually a number. Okay, so that's m defined as a variable, but I don't want m in this case defined as a variable. I want it defined as a symbol that SymPy can work with. So I'm going to have to use SymPy to define it as such. So I'll say m is equal to from the SymPy library, I'm going to call symbol with a capital S and I'm going to pass it in the string M. So what that does is it basically tells SymPy, um, hey, every time you see M here, it's not a variable, but it's a symbol. And I want you to treat it like a symbol within your symbolic math operations. So we're going to want symbols for omega, uh, P0, T1, tau and T. So I'm going to define all of those symbols. OK, now the next thing, now that I have all these symbols, I want to construct an expression that I'm going to integrate. So I want to 
construct the integrand, right? So that's basically just that, that bit of an expression that's sitting after the integration sign that we just worked out. So then what was that? That was tau, right? So tau times, now tau times the sign of something. Because I'm using the sign within SymPy, it's not a, I'm not evaluating the sign numerically. I want to define it as a symbol. Um, I'm going to I'm going to use sign from the SymPy library, right? So it's going to be sim dot sign, and then I'm going to pass in uh, omega times t. Remember, omega and t are symbols. Um, minus omega times tau. Okay, so that was the thing we need to integrate. Now this is where the magic happens. This is where we're going to use SymPy to do the integration for us, right? So I'm going to say sim dot integrate, right? This is integrate, integrate, right? Now we're going to pass this, the function that we need to integrate, which is going to be f, right? Then within a set of parentheses, we've got to pass in what we're integrating with respect to, for us that's tau. We're going to pass in the low, if it's a definite integral, we want to pass in the lower limit and we want to pass in the upper limit. The upper limit was t. So that will perform the integration. I want, and it will give us back the result of the integration, but I want to, I want to assign that to a variable that I'm going to call def int. Um, and at that point, I have enough done that I could literally just execute this cell. And then this line here will print out the definitive integral or the definitive, the definite integral. So let's do that. Okay, excellent. Now, that's it, right? That's the answer, right? You get two, you get two answers. One for when omega is zero. Okay, that's no use to us. We're not interested in that. We want the case when omega is not zero, which is going to be this guy here, this second expression down here. Now, um, that's fine. That's that's an answer, right? But what we can do, what can be helpful to do is we can ask SymPy after it calculates an answer for us, we can say, hey, SymPy, take that thing that you just calculated and try and simplify it, right? And very often you'll end up with it giving you, SymPy will give you back a much simpler expression. Now, sometimes it's a lot simpler, sometimes it's only a little bit simpler. Um, sometimes it's subjective and you mightn't think it's simpler at all, but I find it's worth uh, it's worth uh, seeing what it gives you back after you ask it to simplify. Now, just so we can compare, I won't execute it there. I'll execute it down here uh, so we can compare. So let's see what it does. Okay, so this is the simplified expression. Now we could get ourselves fairly easily from this expression down to this expression. Um, so this is the one, this is the one that we're going to use. So I'm going to take this, I'll execute it back up here. Uh, I'll print myself out a little statement here just uh, to make things a little bit neater so I know what I'm doing. So I'll say SymPy generated the following expression for the definite integral so that when I come back in weeks time and I, I read this, I know exactly what's happened. Okay, and let me just cut that cell. Okay, so that's the first That's the first thing we wanted to do. That's the answer. So we've got to take this guy, bring it back over to our notepad and then combine it with the other elements within that expression for the response to get our final response equation. And just before I do that, I'm going to put in a few notes here. I'll try and be uh, consistent and put in as many notes as I can as we go so that you find this a bit easier to follow. All right, there we have it. So we can jump back over to our notepad now and take this uh, expression and, and combine it with uh, the remaining parts of the expression for, uh, for the system response. Okay, so when we take the expression that SymPy gave us for the integral and we combine it with all of this here and rearrange slightly, we're gonna end up with this expression. And if you let omega n, we know the natural frequency, the angular natural frequency is the square root of the stiffness over the mass. And we rearrange our expression slightly with that substitution, we can say that u of t is going to equal p0 over k. That's the reason I made that substitution because I wanted this term in here, p0 over k, because that's the static displacement. So we've got p0 over k times t over t1 minus the sign of omega n t over omega n t1. Okay, and that's your response, that's it. That's the thing that we were trying to get to. So using Duhamel integral, right, using the Duhamel integral, we took, we took our force, we plugged it straight in. Now we did a little bit of cheating here, right? Because we said that xi was equal to zero. Gave was an easier expression to work with. But anyway, same idea, same principle. You uh, just slightly rearranged our Duhamel integral equation to get this guy. We performed this integration, this guy here, over using SymPy over in our Jupyter Notebook. And then we just combined it with this stuff here and a little bit of rearranging to get this guy down here. Okay, and that is the response of our system. So we can jump back over to our notebook now and actually plot that and see what the response of our system is. 
Okay, so let's now go ahead and try and plot this thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the response, right? I'm going to evaluate that response equation for a number of different single degree of freedom systems, for a range of different systems, right? Just because we can, it's fairly easy for us. So we can we can change the parameters of our system on subsequent plots to see how they influence, those parameters influence um, the, the response of the system. So what we're going to do is calculate a range of different single degree of freedom systems. Now each system is going to have the same mass, but I'm going to change the stiffness of the system. And that's going to give me a range of different natural frequencies. So for each system then, we're going to specify the period of the system in relation to the rise time. Okay, so think about this, right? The rise time is 10 seconds. So I'm going to say, let's say for example, my first single degree of freedom system is going to have a period of oscillation, a natural period of oscillation that is, let's say, 0.3 of the rise time, so three seconds. That will mean I can work out the natural frequency, just one over the period, of that particular system, which means I can work out the stiffness of that system because I'm holding mass constant. And in that way, by specifying the period of the system in relation to the rise time, I'm going to generate a number of different single degree of freedom systems and simulate the response. I mean, we're not going to investigate the responses at all. We're just going to generate a few different ones and plot them, really just for demonstration purposes. So I'm going to start off here by defining some constants or redefining some constants, right? So for example, I defined P0 up here as a symbol. I no longer want it as a symbol. I now want it as a number. So I'm going to redefine it and I'm going to say P0 is going to be a thousand. I'll say T1, again, no longer a symbol. We're done with our symbolic math. So that can be um, a number, 10 seconds. We'll say del T is equal to 0 0.1 uh,10 to the second. And then we're going to generate a time vector. That's going to be, it's going to be um, going from zero up to 10 seconds. And I'm going to break it into tenths of a second. Uh, so that's going to, we're going to use NumPy for that, right? So we're going to say from the NumPy library, take the A range function, which just generates a sequence of numbers, starts at zero, goes up to a value of del T, uh, no, uh, T1, no, T1 plus del T, and it goes up in steps of, steps of del T. So if I print that, you'll see what it is, right? So we're going from zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to 10 seconds. Okay, that's fine. Put in a few notes. So now we can move on down and start actually looping through or generating each of our single degree of freedom systems, right? So I'll say M, the mass of the system is constant for all, all systems. I'll say that's, that's 20 kgs. Then we're going to say, we're going to define a period range, right? So this is just going to be a range of different periods for each of our single degree of freedom systems, right? So I'll say I want one system that has a period of 0.3 of the rise time, one system that has a period of 0.4 times the rise time, and 0.5 times the rise time. These are just arbitrary, right? Just so we have a few different systems that we can visualize. Now that we've defined those, we can come along and initialize a figure to plot onto. All right, so the figure is going to be defined as being equal to from PLT, which was again matplotlib. We're going to say figures. This is just us defining, oops, just defining a figure. We're going to add a set of axes to that figure. So we'll say axes is fig dot add axes. If you've uh, if you've watched any of my courses, you'll have seen me do this like hundreds of times now at this point. So apologies, I'll only I'll only talk through it once like this. So we're defining the like, the position of these set of axes, point one and point one, the width and the height. Okay, so now we have a set of axes defined. We're going to loop through each of our single degree of freedom systems and add a add a line to the set of axes for each system. Right. So looping through for P or in period range. All right. And uh, we're going to say, right, for, again, if you're not familiar with for loops, all this is doing is it's looping through this array of numbers, right, period range. And every time we loop through, PR is going to be one of the different values in here, right? So 0.3 the first time, then 0.4, then 0.5. Okay. So we're going to say the period is equal to PR times uh, T1. So that's the period of our current single degree of freedom system. That would make the natural frequency omega n times two pi over t. So that's two. The constant pi comes from the math library. So that's gonna be math.pi, uh, divide that by t. Then we're gonna have the stiffness is m times omega n squared. So the mass times the angular natural frequency squared. Um, and then we can just evaluate our equation for the response that we've derived already, right? So that was going to be P0 over K 
times now what was it it was t over t1 okay minus a numerator over a denominator and the numerator was equal to sine now because we're going to feed into sine a sequence of numbers a sequence of time values rather than a single value we'll use sine from the numpy library so it's going to be sine of omega n times t and then the denominator was omega n times t1 Okay, excellent. So that should be our response calculated. All we gotta do now is add a line to our axis system for that response. So we're gonna plot, we're gonna plot T against response U, but I want to normalize the time axis by the rise time. So instead of going from zero to 10, it goes from zero to one. And I'm gonna normalize the response of our system by the static response, which was P0 over K. Now that should be a capital P0 over K. Uh, let me see, I want a label so I can tell it each of these different lines apart, right? So the label is gonna be equal to an F string. So that's gonna be F and then a, uh, a string essentially. Um, an F string allows me to put a variable into the string. So I can say T is equal to, we're gonna pass in a variable, it's gonna be PR, and then we're gonna to return to a string T1. And you'll see what, if you're not familiar with this, you'll see it now when it gets plotted onto our set of axes. Now we're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. So we'll, we'll add a set, we'll add a, a line to our set of axes for each one of our single degree of freedom systems. When we've done, when we're loop, when we're done looping through the three different systems, we'll step out of the loop by reversing our indent. And we'll do a little bit of housekeeping, which is just, that's just sort of my term for tidying up our plot. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add an X label. We're gonna add a Y label. We're gonna add a title. We're gonna add a legend in the upper left corner. Uh, then we're gonna set the x-axis limits to go between zero and one. We're going to turn on the grid, so plt.grid, and we're gonna call plt.show because that gets rid of a little text output statement that comes out underneath or above our plot, I can't remember. So let me just run this. Okay, excellent, there we have it. So. There we have it, right? So we've said the time axis is being normalized by the rise time. So we're only simulating the response of our system during that period of time when the load was being applied. So you can see our, our response of our system is, is increasing, right? So essentially we're getting a deflection in our system, but we still have this uh, dynamic oscillation over overlaid on top of the deflection. And we can see how that oscillation changes depending on the, the natural frequency or the period of our system in relation to the rise time of the load. Now, really, you know, we plotted three different systems here just for demonstration purposes. We're not actually going to talk about the differences between these oscillations. We've we've fulfilled our objective by demonstrating how you could calculate the response of a system using an analytical solution to the Duhamel integral. So it's basically job done at this point. And um, we're gonna move on in the next lecture and we're going to talk about how to solve the Duhamel integral using a numerical approach. And again, as I keep emphasizing, that's gonna be the practical way forward that we're gonna use for the rest of this project. So with that said, we'll leave that there, uh, take a break, come back and pick that up in the next lecture.